Book Two, Chapter Four, Part Seven, of History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. History of the Inquisition of Spain, Volume One, by Henry Charles Lee, Book Two chapter four conflicting jurisdictions part seven majorca had no concordia and its tribunal was free to claim what extent of jurisdiction it saw fit limited only by the resistance of the civil authorities which as we have seen was energetically expressed at an early period as defined by porto carrero in 1623 in practice it asserted complete jurisdiction active and passive in civil and criminal cases over its salaried and commissioned officials and their families over familiars in criminal matters active and passive in civil passive only with exclusion of their families the occasion of his book was a violent struggle between the viceroy and the tribunal which presents the ordinary features of these contests for supremacy between rival departments of the government in a search for arms in the house of juan zunez receiver of confiscations some were found the viceroy at once arrested him sentenced him to leave the island within twenty-four hours and shipped him away the inquisitor promptly excommunicated the viceroy the royal fiscal appealed the viceroy and royal judges summoned the inquisitor to a conference preparatory to a competencia or to appear in the bench real and defend his proceedings on his refusal the banch real pronounced sentence of banishment and seizure of temporalities which was published with sound of drum and trumpet they also issued an edict declaring the censures null and void and ordering the clergy to disregard them they refused to consider themselves excommunicated they attended mass and apparently had the support of the people and clergy for no attention was paid to the interdict cast on the city by the inquisitor what was the final result does not appear nor does it much matter the significance in these affairs is the spectacle presented to the people of lawless collisions between the representatives and exponents of the law in majorca the most impressive cases of this kind occurred between the inquisition and the ecclesiastical courts and will be considered hereafter it suffices here to say that broils with the secular authorities were constant and contributed their share to occupy and distract the attention of the central government it would be superfluous to enumerate those of which the details have chanced to reach us they would merely prove that considering their small size and scanty population the balearic isles were not behind their continental sisters of aragon in adding to the perplexities of the monarchy this somewhat prolonged recital of the struggles of the kingdoms of the crown of aragon gives an opportunity of realizing the stubborn resistance to the arrogant pretensions of the inquisition of provinces which still retained institutions through which public opinion could assert itself the people of the kingdoms of castile had been reduced to submission under the absolutism of the house of austria and though they might at times complain they could make no effective efforts to ameliorate their position when in fifteen seventy nine and again in fifteen eighty three the cortes of castile complained of the arrest and immurement in the secret prisons of individuals in every quarrel with an official of the inquisition to the permanent disgrace of families philip the second merely replied that he would make inquiry and take such action as was fitting the only resource was to raise contests in individual cases and these were frequent enough and violent enough to prove that there was the same spirit of opposition to inquisitorial encroachment and the same pervading discontent with the abuses flourishing so rankly under inquisitorial protection instances of this could be cited almost without limit but one or two will suffice as examples of the multiform aspect of these quarrels and the temper in which they were fought over it should be borne in mind that in these struggles as in those of aragon 
there was no question of freedom of conscience and no desire to limit the effectiveness of the holy office as the guardian of purity of faith the castilian like the catalan looked with exultation on the triumph over heresy in the autos de fe and he desired only to set bounds to the intrusion of the inquisition on the field of secular justice the chancellery of granada was the supreme tribunal of new castile as that of valladolid was of old castile the alcaldes of its sala del crimen constituted the highest criminal court from which there was no appeal save to god april fifteenth sixteen twenty three the alcalde mayor after five days trial condemned jeronimo palomino a habitual criminal and ruffian to two hundred lashes and six years of galleys for various offences including sundry blasphemies on the twenty fourth the sala confirmed the sentence and ordered its execution on the same day the inquisition served two notices on the alcalde mayor prohibiting his cognizance of the case as some of the alleged crimes concerned the faith over which it had exclusive jurisdiction and it demanded the surrender of the accused and of all the papers under the customary combinations the alcalde mayor responded by calling for a competencia and offering to deliver palomino for trial on any charges of heresy if record were made that he was already a galley slave to be returned to the royal prison the next day the tribunal sent to the prison and claimed him on the pretext that the case had been transferred to it whereupon the alcalde of the prison surrendered him without orders from the judges when the latter heard of this they also learned that the transfer had been effected through the efforts of the prisoner's friends and liberal bribery of the officials of the tribunal who had been active in getting him out of prison after satisfying themselves of this by investigation they ordered the arrest of four laymen a notary a messenger and two familiars and they further imprisoned in their houses the alcalde mayor and alcalde of the prison for acting without informing the sala the tribunal concluded palomino's trial within forty-eight hours sentencing him to hear a mass in the audience chamber and it appears that it returned him it further commenced proceedings against the alcaldes summoning them to liberate the officials within three hours under pain of excommunication the alcaldes protested against this and demanded a competencia as provided under the concordia but the next day they were excommunicated in all the churches and this was followed by an interdict laid on the city this forced the compromise by which the prisoners were liberated subject to rearrest in case the competencia should result in justifying the alcaldes and the latter were absolved from the censures the matter seemed to be settled but all parties had counted without the impetuous and aggressive inquisitor general pacheco without awaiting further information and in disregard of the laws prescribing peaceful settlement by competencias he had evoked the case to himself and acted upon it off-hand two days after the absolution the inquisitors reimposed the excommunication by his command and notices were served on the alcaldes and the alguazil mayor to appear before him within fifteen days to stand trial against this they protested and on their failure to appear they were not only excommunicated afresh but anathematized in all the churches the scandal had thus assumed national proportions the alcaldes were the direct and highest judicial representatives of the king but such was philip's subservience to the inquisition that he would not permit a competencia following the regular course but took the affair into his own hands the president of the council of castile in remitting to the royal favorite olivares july fourth sixteen twenty three a memorial from the council declared that the condition to which the chancellery of granada was reduced owing to the methods of the inquisition was the most ignominious that had ever been heard of in spain especially considering how slight was the cause of all this disquiet for when everything was settled it was again enkindled at the mandate of the inquisitor-general as the matter was in the king's hands the council could do nothing but appeal to his majesty with all the disadvantages under which it labored in combating the inquisitor-general 
had its hands been free it might already have conquered to the benefit of the royal jurisdiction and service of the king for every day brought greater disturbance to the republic in spite of this appeal philip decided in favor of the inquisition and the humiliation of the chancellery was complete yet pacheco was not satisfied with victory and proceeded to trample on the vanquished in the course of the quarrel gudiel de peralta one of the judges and matias gonzalez de sepulveda the fiscal of the court had drawn up legal arguments in its justification this pacheco submitted to his censors who of course discovered latent heresies lurking in them whereupon he ordered them to be suppressed as heretical and announced his intention of proceeding rigorously against the authors the council on october seventh again appealed to philip the accused it said had only defended the royal jurisdiction in a perfectly legitimate manner the inquisitor-general should not have attacked royal officials and inflicted irreparable injury on them and their posterity by denouncing them as heretics without consulting the king he was begged to intervene and order pacheco to suspend proceedings while a junta of the two councils should consider the papers and decide what course should be taken it is probable that in some such way this indefensible attempt was suppressed for neither of the inculpated names appeared in the expurgatory index of zapata in sixteen thirty two it would seem difficult to set bounds to the power of an organization which could thus arbitrarily employ the censures of the church on any department of the government without being subject to control save to that of a king docile to its exigencies yet the suprema which always sustained the tribunals in their wanton excesses adapted their quarrels and fought them unsparingly to the end was thoroughly conscious of their wrong-doing while this conflict was in progress it issued a carta acordada april twenty third earnestly exhorting the tribunals to maintain friendly relations with the royal officials and not to waste time in dissensions to the neglect of their duties in matters of faith competencias were always to be admitted and no censures were to be employed without consulting the suprema unless delay was inadmissible how nugatory were these counsels of moderation under the dominance of such a man as pacheco was soon afterwards manifested in a still more scandalous outbreak in seville under his direction in sixteen twenty five the assistente or governor fernando ramirez Farinas, himself a member of the council of castile and a man of high consideration was excommunicated and thus prevented from concluding a negotiation for a donation to the king of eighty thousand ducats his alguazil an honorable man was wounded and was shut up in prison to keep him out of the hands of the tribunal which declared that he was wanted on a matter of faith thus covering him and his family with infamy the king and olivares were besieged by pacheco on the one hand and the council of castile on the other the king as usual sided with the inquisition and the president of the council tendered his resignation with the suggestion that his office had better be given to pacheco who by holding both positions could cover up these scandals while the royal jurisdiction could scarce be reduced to greater degradation it is no wonder that olivares in a letter to the president declared himself to be the most unfortunate of men for he could satisfy nobody his best course would be to ask the king to let him abandon the management of affairs when the kingdom was in such straits that he could scarce take time to breathe in devising remedies his efforts were wasted in competencias and he concluded with the despairing declaration that he lost his senses in thinking over it without knowing what to say the statesmen who were guiding the destinies of spain in those perilous times might well groan under the superfluous burden of deciding these contests over trifles so ferociously waged but they were not to be spared arce y reynoso was not so violent as pacheco but he was equally obstinate and was determined to emancipate the inquisition wholly by relieving it from royal supervision there was an instructive case at cuenca in sixteen forty five where the corredor don alonso muñoz de castilblanque sent a band of assassins to murder a woman with whom he had illicit relations together with a priest named jacinto 
the crime created great excitement but muñoz was a contador or accountant of the tribunal and as such a titular official he presented himself before the inquisitors who assumed his case and promptly excommunicated the judge who attempted to prosecute him philip had the matter investigated and was told that both the woman and the priest had been killed he sent to the suprema a decree ordering the removal of the excommunication and the delivery of the criminal to the council of castile to be tried by the judge which it had appointed for the inquisitors could not properly punish so atrocious a crime without incurring irregularity this was clear and peremptory enough but in place of obeying it arce y reynoso replied may fourth sixteen forty five that this would be a great and unheard of violation of the rights of the holy office the woman was not dead but was in valencia where the tribunal was busily collecting evidence to hand munoz over to the secular judges for trial and execution would incur the same irregularity as sentencing him the case would be tried by the suprema which had a wide range of suitable penalties that did not infer irregularity meanwhile munoz would be safely guarded and he trusted that the king would not set so pernicious an example when philip rejected this appeal and repeated his order a learned and elaborate argument was prepared to show that he had no power to interfere it took the ground to which we have already referred that the temporal jurisdiction of the inquisition over its officials was a grant from the papacy it was exclusive and unlimited and no secular ruler could deprive the holy office of it the pope had power to make this grant and the king had none to remove this or any other case from its cognizance for he was not supreme over the ecclesiastical and papal jurisdiction the truth being that the papal commissions to the inquisitor-general conferred power to remove and punish subordinates but said nothing as to its being exclusive and equally fallacious was the citation of three authorities whose utterances had no bearing on the question at issue this audacious reliance on the ignorance of philip and his secular advisers was successful philip made one or two efforts more but arce y reynoso held good a memorial in sixteen forty eight on the general subject from a member of the council of castile tells the king that his repeated commands in the case of muñoz had been disobeyed and that although the criminal had so long been in the hands of the inquisitors he had not yet been sentenced which he held to be clear proof that their aim was to defend their officials from the royal justice and not to punish them how liberal was the construction placed on this term of titular official was illustrated when in sixteen twenty two at toledo the corredor arrested the butcher of the tribunal for intolerable frauds on the public the inquisitor demanded the prisoner and the papers published the corredor in all the churches as excommunicate seized the alguazil and apparitor who had made the arrest cast them into the secret prison tried them as if for heresy shaved their heads and beards and banished them and refused to their families any evidence that would preserve their posterity from infamy there was danger of a rising in toledo against the inquisition but it was averted the council of castile protested and a junta was held which adopted measures to prevent a repetition of such outrages but as usual no attention was paid to them it would be superfluous to multiply examples of the perennial struggle which was distracting the energies of the government and weakening the respect for law in every quarter of spain each tribunal contributed its share and there was an unending stream of cases pouring into madrid for settlement each side blamed the other for this anomalous condition in sixteen thirty two the suprema in defending the tribunal of valencia for its protection of criminal familiars bitterly complained that the object of the concordias was the relief of the tribunals the punishment of offenders the quick despatch of cases and the diminished oppression of pleaders but that this had been converted into perpetual strife regardless of forms and rules of procedure for this it was itself primarily to blame for though there were doubtless faults on both sides the cases recorded in the reports and the arguments of the inquisition show that it was the chief offender 
its aggressive powers were too much greater than those of its adversaries and its methods were too sharp for the secular authorities often to risk the consequences of being in the wrong there was another direction in which the holy office sought to interfere with the administration of justice so complete is the independence of secular authority claimed by the church for those in holy orders that the license from a bishop is held to be necessary before a cleric can obey a summons to appear as a witness in a lay court even in civil cases the inquisition included this among the exemptions of all connected with it whether lay or clerical and even extended it to familiars the privilege seems generally to have been conceded as respects the salaried officials but as applied to familiars it was too grotesque not to excite opposition the Concordia of 1568, as we have seen, provided that familiars should testify before secular judges without requiring license from inquisitors, and that the latter should not prohibit them from so doing, which infers that it was an abuse requiring correction, and also that officials were conceded to enjoy the exemption. The power to summon a witness necessarily includes that of coercing him to testify, and this was exercised by imprisoning recalcitrants which came to be regarded as an infraction of privilege in sixteen forty nine in the case of claudio bolano a familiar imprisoned for refusing to give evidence the tribunal of valencia formed a competencia pending which he was released under bail to both jurisdictions the question was of difficult solution and the competencia dragged on for ten years without settlement then in sixteen fifty nine the same thing occurred and another competencia was formed in which the most that the inquisition would concede was that when the evidence was indispensable a notary should be sent to the familiar's house to take it in secret basing this upon the danger to which witnesses were exposed in the violent factions of the time the question however was settled in sixteen ninety nine in the case of felipe bru at hativa on august fourteen sixteen ninety eight don luis salzedo lord of pamis was shot and killed when standing at a window of his house don vicente monserrat judge of the audiencia of valencia found bru who was a familiar a contumacious witness he was first given the town as a prison then his house and finally was confined in chains he appealed to the tribunal which ordered his release within three days under pain of excommunication and five hundred ducats a competencia was formed which in november sixteen ninety nine was decided in favour of the royal jurisdiction it was probably in consequence of this discussion that on july fifteenth a royal decree was issued compelling familiars to give evidence in secular courts even this did not abate the pretensions of the inquisition for when in 1702 joseph perez of montesa a familiar was ordered under penalty of a thousand ducats not to leave that town because a deposition was wanted from him he appealed to the tribunal of valencia which with the usual threats commanded the revocation of the order on this being refused Perez went to Valencia and had himself incarcerated in the secret prison, where he was inaccessible. The audiencia pursued the matter. There was considerable correspondence and preparations for a competencia, but finally the affair was settled by sending Perez to the house of the regent of the audiencia, where he made his deposition. To the end, however, the tribunal maintained the position that, if any constraint was used it would resist and protect the familiar unless a competencia decided to the contrary end of book two chapter four part seven recording by shenna sayre fresno california